Well, good morning, good afternoon, good whatever time of day it is that you are uh, watching this. And if you're somebody that doesn't uh, join us uh, in-house on a Sunday morning, then you've probably worked out by now this is not a normal Sunday. No, uh, we're actually in lockdown again uh, here in Lismore. Uh, it's looking like uh, next week we'll be back uh, with uh, in-person attendance here. Uh, but again, this Sunday we're back online. Praise God for the technology. Praise God that we have the opportunity to still come to you uh, and still continue our journey together. Um, for the last uh, five weeks, we've been talking about the topic of worry uh, and anxiety. And uh, as I've been promising the people here that every week I keep saying, next week we'll finish, next week we'll finish. Well, this week we're going to try to tie it all in and uh, wrap it all up. Just let me very quickly just recap on a few of the main points that we've covered in the last uh, five weeks. Um, number one, anxiety and worry are not a sin. Uh, Jesus never said anxiety and worry were sins. Uh, they're not good for us. They have an impact on us, but they're not sins. So if you are somebody that uh, has worry or uh, anxiety in the world, you're not sinning. Um, they're results of other things. Uh, but worry and anxiety are not sins. Number two, uh, anxiety and worry tend to breed in areas of our world where faith in God is absent or underdeveloped. So faith, uh, where, where areas of faith are underdeveloped or where faith is absent, that tends to be the kind of climate where worry and anxiety want to embed themselves, and that's where they generally tend to breed the most. So if we have areas in our world of, of worry and anxiety, now again, I'm not talking about uh, clinically diagnosed anxiety disorders. We're not going there. We're not talking about that. Go back to week one and you'll understand and see our stance on that. Uh, but this is just uh, that, that low level anxiety and worry that we all generally tend to deal with. Um, those areas tend to breed primarily in areas where we aren't quite sure whether we can trust God or how to trust God or maybe what even God says about that particular area of our world. So worry and anxiety tend to breed in areas where faith is either absent or underdeveloped. Number three, anxiety and worry are indicators uh, that we need to pray. So for those of you that are watching that have a faith in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, I'm speaking to you. Uh, worry and anxiety, according to what Paul wrote in Philippians, he said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and petition, let your requests be made known to God. So uh, when we have areas of our world where we're uh, feeling anxious and worrying, Paul's suggestion to us, Paul's encouragement to us is take that anxiety and that worry and present that to God. And the way we give that to God is through this activity that we as Christians call prayer, where we go and we present those requests, bring those worries, bring those anxieties to God in prayer. Number four, prayer creates an environment where God can replace our worry and anxiety with his peace. Paul goes on in Philippians and he says um, that when we uh, present our requests to God, uh, our worries, our concerns, he says, and the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, will guard your hearts and mind. So as we come to God in prayer, we present our worries and our anxieties to him. Supernaturally, he replaces them with the peace of God. It's a supernatural peace. It's not a peace that we rationalize. It's something that comes from God, the God we believe in. It's something that comes from God into uh, our hearts and into our minds, and we begin to uh, uh, sense and feel and experience the actual peace of God. Uh, number uh, five, the degree to which I can learn to trust God in an area of my life is the degree to which I can experience the peace of God in that area. So the more I learn to trust God in an area, the more I come to understand that God is involved in and in control of and God sees and understands what's happening in this area of my life. The more I bring God into that area, the greater capacity I have to experience peace and to let go of the anxiety and the worry and the trust because I know God is, is present with me in that moment, in that situation, in that circumstance. I know that God is aware of whatever that thing is that's causing me trouble and anxiety. So the degree to which I bring God into that is the degree to which I can begin to experience peace. And number six, the master we choose to serve is the one we're dependent upon to determine and to meet our legitimate needs. And we talked about that last week, that, that when we think about serving a master, we don't want to always think about the connotation of uh, serve or else. Uh, you need to serve really well or the master can come down hard on you uh, like a ton of bricks that if you don't serve well, the master can remove you from uh, his presence and from <coughs> his service. 
But there's another side to the master as well. And that's what Jesus has been talking about in Matthew chapter 6 in the broader context. He's been talking about that the, the one that you submit yourself to, the one you become subservient to, the one that you call your master and that you choose to serve uh, their best interests, that master takes care of the needs of his servants. And we saw that last week uh, in those bookend passages that we talked about uh, in Matthew chapter 6. I think it was verse 24 and 33 when we talked about those. You can't serve serve two masters and uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And you can go back last week and look at that. So I kept keep saying to you that we're going to get there to the meat of Matthew 6 and we're going to tie this up and I'm going to keep my promise this week. We're going to dive into uh, Matthew chapter 6. Now we've looked at a broader picture of why it is that it's possible for us to live, to live a life with diminished worry and anxiety and heightened faith and trust in God. Now we're going to get into the meat of what I probably think is one of the most beautiful passages ever recorded. Uh, that Jesus spoke or that Jesus um, taught uh, here in Matthew chapter 6. And, and it's verse 24 uh, right through to uh, verse 33. <laughs> and he says this, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Notice the focus of the worry. It's all self-worry, isn't it? I'm worrying about myself. He's saying, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, and so on. He says, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. Now, you can imagine these guys are sitting outside on a hill. It's called the Sermon on the Mount because it's on, the, on, a, on a hill. Uh, and Jesus is sitting there and he says to the crowd, I want you to imagine, um, look at the birds of the air. Now I'm uh, guessing there were probably birds flitting around so they probably were able to turn and in the moment focus on a bird of the air and think about what he was going to say. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. You're not of more value than they. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Or some translations say, which of you, by worrying, can add one hour to his life? So because you can't do that, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Watch this. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of them. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not say, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? All these things the Gentiles seek after. In other words, the focus of the, 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 the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the focus of their life is this temporal material world and they chase after the things that will meet the cravings and the needs of this temporal uh, uh, short existence, this time frame that we have here on planet Earth. Those of you that come regularly to Arise would know what I mean when I say the crack in the wall there. It, it's, it's such a short part of our eternal existence, yet, yet these people chase after and, and focus and go for the things that are so temporal without thinking about the eternal space of life or the eternal implications or value of life. But he says to us in verse 33, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The focus of the Gentiles is all about this temporal world, but he says, But those of you that follow me, what you should do, I want you to seek first my kingdom, seek first that which is broader and bigger, not just be so fixed on the temporal that you don't think or give any thought to the eternal and the, the eternal issues of life or the eternal things of life. And this is what he's saying in Matthew chapter 6. So it's okay to show concern for the things of life. There's nothing wrong with concern, but what he says is he's encouraging us, don't let your concerns turn into worry. Just a little thought, how do you know if a concern has become a worry? And the way I look at that in my own world is this. There are things that I am concerned about. There are things that I look at and think about and I have general concerns. I'm concerned about them because I'm a responsible person and there are some things I'm responsible for. And so I begin to think about something and in the thought process, maybe I begin to make plans and, and try to work out uh, ways that maybe I can uh, achieve or do or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that planning process either. Uh, not worrying doesn't mean don't plan, don't think about. Uh, it, it doesn't mean just pick up a Bible, lock yourself in a room, pray, uh, sit in a, a, a meditative position and read a Bible all day and everything will just drop out of the sky for you. He's not saying that. 
Even when he talks about the birds of the air, he says, God feeds the birds of the air. But you know, the birds have a part to play in that still. Let's keep it in perspective. Uh, The worm's in the ground. The bird comes down. He still gets out of his nest. He still flies down to the ground. But there's plentiful worms on the ground. Every day when he gets out of his nest and he flies down, there's never going to be a shortage of worms in the ground. But the bird still plays his part. So when Jesus says, don't worry, it's not this utopic spiritual thing where we just sit and we do nothing. We still have responsibility in life. And for me, the way I tell the difference between concern, healthy concern, and what's become a worry is when I think about something and then I need to move on to the next area of my day or next part of my world can I then take that place it on a shelf and then move on to the next thing or can I not do that because it's constantly running around in the back of my mind and in the back of my heart and I can't place it on a shelf so to speak and move on with my day if I get to that point then I think I've gone beyond the state of healthy concern and just thinking about something and maybe I've moved into that space of worry that Jesus I believe is talking about here don't worry about your life don't worry about those things don't let healthy concern go that step further where it becomes a consuming thought a consuming worry for you now in the process of this uh, Jesus actually uh, asks four questions and this is what I want to drill down on today to wrap up this whole uh, series we've been doing on anxiety and worry I want to drill down on four questions that Jesus asks the crowd now I want you to imagine and get the full context here these are real people sitting on the edge of a hill giving up their time it wasn't a paid event they didn't have to be there Jesus uh, was Jesus and he he turns to the crowd and he begins to teach people are there because they wanted to sit there for various reasons I believe people came to hear Jesus for various reasons Uh, but and we don't know all the reasons why everybody was there but they're sitting there and they're listening to him and Jesus during this asks four questions now I believe they were rhetorical questions probably questions that Jesus didn't want them to give him an answer for But nonetheless, they were questions that he wanted them to think about. Questions that he wanted them to perhaps meditate on. Because I believe these questions, if we can answer these questions, the answers to those questions will give us a very real perspective of where our faith and our capacity to trust God really is at. How many of you know we we probably all think things about ourselves that aren't true? Have you ever ever realized that you thought something and it turns out that not everything you think is actually true and so we we have processes and things that we do we ask questions we people do questionnaires we we question other people there are ways that we get to the heart of the reality of life because sometimes what I think about life is not real sometimes what I think about other people is not real and often what I think about myself might not be real too so it's good to have processes and things in place where we can self-examine and in particular I think it's really important to go back to that place of faith in our own world and ask ourselves the questions where's my faith uh, really at when it comes to trusting in Jesus and trusting in God and that's what these four questions are about I believe they're not something that we just are going to look at today but I'm going to encourage each of us to to think about these questions I go back regularly to these questions and I re-ask myself those questions and I re-examine my heart and where my faith's really at in the light of these things I think they're key to those of us that want to walk with Jesus and be real about where we're at with him four key questions that he asks us to meditate on and here's where they are the first key question is this. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says this. Question number one. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. And here's the question. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Ask yourself that question right now. Is not life, is your life more than food and clothing? Is your life more than the temporal things that the world screams at you that it's all about does your life uh, have room for the eternal things do you understand that life is more than food and the body more than clothing how much of what you worry about in life is simply temporal stuff that's here today gone tomorrow I wonder how many things you've stressed and worried about in life that in hindsight a, a day later a month later a year later 10 years later you look back And you go, I can't believe that I worried so much about that temporal thing that did not have the ramifications I thought it would have down the track. Uh, Why did I give it so much room or so much of a grip on my life? It's easy to say that in hindsight. But when we look back in hindsight and we learn lessons, we're hoping that what we learn in hindsight we can take as foresight as we go forward into the future. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
You know, Jesus has just finished telling them that we should store up treasures in heaven. So I want you to think eternal things. He's talking about storing up things uh, in heaven where moth can't destroy, rust can't take away, thieves can't break in and steal. But the world we live in every day tries to keep our attention only on this world. And it tells us what we need to make it in this world while we're here. Um, you have to have this. You need to buy that. You need to save for this. You need to go there. You need to shop here. You need to eat here. The world we live in is constantly trying to pull our attention back into the temporal, making, th- making the things of this world the primary focus of your life and of my life. That's what the world does. That's what advertising and marketing does, and that's the message we get from a world that doesn't believe in God and doesn't believe in eternity. If you don't believe in God and you don't believe in eternity, I understand why the things of this world would would so, uh, you would so gravitate to them and they would become such a, a passionate focus for you. But for those of us that follow Jesus, there's more to life than simply the temporal things of this world. Life is eternal. Life uh, has, has ramifications that go beyond our actions, our activities, our words have ramifications that go beyond just creating something here in the natural world. We can create things spiritually. We can change spiritual environments. We can, change, uh, we can be used of God to change the eternal destiny of another human being if we realize that eternity is a part of our psyche and a part of our life. If we realize that and we get our eyes off not just this temporal world. See, Jesus gives us a few things about life, and I'll just quickly throw these at you. Um, Jesus is a non-negotiable part of true life. Jesus himself said this, that he is a non-negotiable part of true life. See, life is more than breathing and blood running through our veins. How many of you know that there are people that are, there's a difference between existing and actually living? There's a difference between existing on planet Earth and actually living the way God intended for human beings made in his image to be and to live down here. There's a big difference. In John chapter 10, verse 10, everybody knows this verse. If you're a believer, it's a famous one. We hear a lot about it. And Jesus himself said this. He said, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. In other words, there's one that wants to come into your world, and Jesus here indirectly is referring to the devil. If you read the context of the story, he's more directly referring to religion. Religion comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But of course, the devil is the author of religion. Religion is all about what we do, how we can work our way up to God, what we've achieved, what we've done. True Christianity is about what God has done to reach down to us, what he's achieved, and what we, by grace, walk into and accept. And so Jesus said in John 10.10, the thief doesn't come but to steal, kill, and destroy. And he said this, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He's speaking to people who have a biological life. There's blood flowing through their brain, uh, uh, bodies, oxygen that's pumping through their lungs, their brains are functioning. Uh, He's speaking to people with biological life, but he makes this statement to them. He said, I've actually come to give you something that right now you don't have. So life is more than just the temporal, natural, eternal. Jesus is saying here, I am a non-negotiable part of life. And and, and I wonder, is Jesus, the presence of God, the person of Jesus, a non-negotiable part of your life? Or is he just a secondary thought? Is he just something that maybe on a Sunday when I come to church, I think about him. But the rest of the week, it really doesn't matter too much who Jesus is or or what Jesus is about or what he said, what he's worked, so on. But, But Jesus here is saying to these people, without me, without me, you are not having life the way that God intended life in its fullness to be. Life is more than just this temporal existence. The second thing is that God's word is a non-negotiable part of true life. John 6, 63, Jesus said this. He said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So Jesus is a non-negotiable part of what it means to have life. And God's word is a non-negotiable part of what it actually means to have life. What sort of place do you give to the word of God? What sort of place do you give to the teachings of Jesus? Jesus here is saying that, that, that Jesus himself is a part of what true life is, that his words are a part of what true life is, beyond the temporal, natural things that you need. And the other thing is that doing the will of God 
is a part of true life. In John chapter 4, verse 31 to 34, we all know the story. Jesus goes to, uh, uh, he, he's heading uh, uh, through Samaria and he stops off and his disciples go into town to shop to get food. And there's a woman at a well and he begins this discourse with the woman. And uh, at the end of that, the disciples come back. The woman runs into the town to bring the, the, the village people out. To, not the village people as in YMCA, but the people in the town. So he goes to bring them out uh, to see Jesus. And when his disciples come back out, it says, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat, because they come back with food. And Jesus says this to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus is a non-negotiable part of what it means to have life according to God. God's word is a non-negotiable part of what it means to have life in its fullness according to God. And so too is doing the will of God. Finding the will of God and doing the will of God with your life. And the will of God, I'm not talking about what's that big picture thing that I need to go and do. I'm talking about the will of God every day of your life. The attitude that you take to work. The way you treat your children or the way you treat your spouse. The words you use when you're uh, at the sporting field. I'm talking about the things you allow yourself to watch and meditate on. The will of God is being outworked every moment of your day. You're confronted with options and opportunities to, to give the highest regard to the temporal world or to give a higher regard to the eternal world question number one is not life more than food and the body more than clothing jesus made it very clear to us that your deepest needs what it means to be human is way more than simply the physical question number one is not life more than food and the body more than clothing question number two and we find that in the very next verse matthew six twenty six. look at the birds of the air For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And here's the question too. Are you not of more value than they? Are you not of more value than they? Now now, now let's be clear. We live in a world today that is trying to give equal value to just about everything. I don't think we truly understand what equal value is, but that's what we're trying to do. Let me make it very simple. We live in a world today where we're, we're trying to say that, that mankind, that the animal kingdom, and that the natural environment and the plants are all on a level picking. I read a story the other day, and uh, by the way, I'm an incredible lover of animals. I, I have a great heart for animals, and uh, I could be Dr. Doolittle happily. I love having animals around. Uh, I love the environment as well. Uh, I believe that we're meant to manage the environment. We should be looking after it, and uh, whether we're doing a good or bad job, it's not for me to say here today, uh, but I do believe that we need to steward the world we've been placed in very, very well and very carefully. But I also also uh, believe this that man has greater value than plant life and man has greater value than the animals i read a story this week and it was speaking about if you uh did something to uh sorry a couple of weeks ago if you do something to an animal if you were cruel to your dog let's say you kicked your dog which i hope you don't you should never do uh, but let's say you kick your dog then according to the law you can be put up on domestic violence charges the same as if you hit another person Domestic violence charges for kicking a dog or or hurting an animal. Now, I'm not advocating hurting animals. I don't believe that we should. We should be looking after them, doing the right thing by them. But the point I'm trying to make here is we live in a world that's trying to up the value of everything else and in doing so, bring down the actual value of humanity, bring down the actual value of man. What do you think? Are you of more value than creation? Do you believe that you as a human being hold more value than the rest of creation? And when I talk about holding more value, I'm talking about this in the eyes of God. Do you believe when God looks down on planet Earth that he places greater value on humanity, greater value on people than he does on everything else? That's a very important question in regards to your faith. Are you the one that God is most concerned about or are you secondary compared to all other things down here on planet Earth? Matthew 12, verse 11 to 12, Jesus said this. He said, What man among you has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? You know, if you go back to the creation story, go back to Genesis chapter 1 and you read it through. It's a beautiful uh, 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 
beautifully written uh, description of, of creation there in Genesis 1. And it repetitively makes these statements. It says, uh, uh, let there be. God says, let there be, and there was. Let there be, and there was. Let there be, and there was. That, that word, let there be, it literally means let, let it become, let it come to pass, let it exist, let it happen. So when God created everything, he said, let there be, let there be, let there be. But he changed his angle and his tact when it came to creating man. And instead of saying, let it there be or let it be, he says, let us make. Let us make man in our own image. That word there literally means to make, to fashion or to accomplish so we get this picture of God saying, let there be, let that thing be, let that thing be, let that thing be. Speak it out, there it is, there it is. When it came to mankind, God got his hands dirty and he fashioned and he made. And the very fact that we are made in the very image of God, what theologians call the Imago Dei, the image of God, tells me that man has a place in the heart of God that is above the rest of of creation. And if I narrow that down, I can take that on board personally. Do I believe that I personally have a place in the heart of God that's higher than the rest of the created order? It's an important question. Number one, we're made in his image. And the second thing is that we were, giving an, we were given an elevated status among creation as well. Remember in the beginning, he made everything. Let there be, let there be, let there be, then let us make man. And then he gave man a place that was elevated above creation by saying, now you, mankind, humanity, take dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the animals. Take dominion over the garden. Look after, tend, and steward this world that I've given to you. Let me be very clear. We need to steward the world well, but we're not called to worship the world. The world is a beautiful place and we need to look after it. But the true value the true value lies in the heart of man, lies in humanity, because we are the ones that are made in the image of of God. We are the ones that God made and fashioned and formed and got his hands dirty in the process of. I heard somebody put it this way once. They said this, God, just like us, cares more about his kids than he does his pets and his garden. I like that. God, like us, cares more about his, ki- about his kids than he does about his pets and his garden. Think about it. What holds more value for you? What holds more value for you if there was a, a house uh, uh, burning down uh, and, and, and somebody in that house and you ran into that house? What would you do first? Would you grab that person and pull that person out? Or would you grab a pet or would you grab a thing? You know, I think for most of us, if we ran into that burning building and we knew there was a human in there, there's just something inside of us that, sh- that, that shows us there's inherent value in that person, much more value than the material possessions in that building, much more value than, than the pets that may be in there, the birds or the goldfish or whatever. We, we would go and we would grab that person because in the depth of our heart, we know it. As a matter of fact, this is one of the things that really uh, interested me and kind of got me uh, thinking along the lines of my faith and the fact that I think there must be a, a, a God out there. See, I, I, I heard like everybody that we just came from a, a blob of mud or a bang or whatever it was and that basically we were cockroaches one day or fish and we evolved and grew up. And a couple of questions I had, number one was how come I got lucky and the cockroach there in the corner of my kitchen didn't get lucky? How come he's still crawling around looking like a cockroach? Something doesn't seem fair here. Or was I just one of the really, really lucky ones? I found that hard to rationalise. And the second thing I realised one day was, you know what, I could walk over to that cockroach and put my foot on that thing and squash that thing into the ground and not have a twinge in my conscience about killing that cockroach but I could never harm a human baby. I could never harm another person and not feel the same way. There's something inherent within us. We know that humans, we know that that humanity has high value. And I think that comes from the fact that deep down inside, we know that mankind, we know that people are created and fashioned and formed in the very image of God himself. Question number three that Jesus asks here, and we find it in the next verse, verse uh, 27. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature. Or some translations say, which of you, my worrying, can add one hour to his life? It seems like a crazy question, and it seems like something that we shouldn't have to ask. Why would Jesus ask that question to the crowd? Surely they're smart enough to realize worry changes nothing. But then think about yourself right now. Are you smart enough to realize worry changes nothing? I know I'm not, because I still find myself at times worrying about things. 
So it's not as obvious to us as what maybe we think it is when we read it on the pages of, of, of these ancient manuscripts. We read it, but if we put ourselves in the position of Jesus saying it to us and asking us to meditate and think about this question, it's actually not as obvious. Which of you, by worrying, can add a single cubit to his stature? The answer's obvious, but the implications are not. See, people say that worry changes nothing. Now, if that was actually true, then there wouldn't actually be any problem with worrying. It, would, it wouldn't be good for you. It wouldn't be bad either. Worry would just simply be neutral. Uh, but the fact is that, that worry does change something. And the problem is worry never changes the object of the worry. It only changes the worry. -er. Worry doesn't have the capacity or the power to change the object of the worry. But what it does do is it has the capacity and the power to change the worrier themselves. Worry is not a neutral thing. It has negative implications for us. Neuroscientists have, have studied out and told us that worry does things to our brain. Uh, medical doctors have, 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 done, have, have got the research, the data to say that worry has physical implications to our actual body. And I think worry has a spiritual connotation to it as well. So Jesus isn't saying don't worry for his benefit. He's saying don't worry for yours. It's, it's, it's like the Ten Commandments. You know, people think that, that, that God came up with all these rules because he needed you to do them so that, because he got something out of it. Because if you obey the rules, he feels good about himself. If you obey the rules, then God feels like God. He feels like the king because he has all these subservient people doing what he says. It's not true. God asks us to do things because God knows that the things he's asking us to do will make our life here better for us. It's about us. God cares for us. God has concern for his creation. God loves his creation. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. God so loves us. He truly does. He values us above all other created things and he loves us and he wants to care for us. And when he asks us not to do something, it's because God has logical and loving limitations, not to destroy life, but to bring true life, not to take away our fun, but to enhance our capacity to really, really enjoy this journey of life that we're on. Who are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to the author and creator of life or are we going to listen to culture? Are we going to listen to, to, to a world that screams at us from a foundational perspective that God does not exist anyway? And so take God out of the picture and they're giving us a basis of what life should look like and you know what? It might be true if God didn't exist. But you see, the problem here is I believe God does exist. So because I believe God does exist, what the world's telling me doesn't make sense and it doesn't Stand up under scrutiny. So I want to listen to the author and creator of life, the one who loved me so much that he gave his only son so that we could be back in relationship together. That's the one that I want to trust. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature or one hour to his life? And of course, the obvious answer is you can't. Here's a thought. Worry actually has zero power to change whatever it is right now that you're worrying about. Let me say that again. Worry has zero power or zero capacity to change the thing that you're worried about right now. So Jesus is saying, why worry? Bring it to me. Give it to me. Trust me. Bring me into that picture. Bring me into that space. Don't worry. You know why we don't need to worry? Because what I'm seeing in Matthew chapter 6 is this. God's saying, you don't have to worry about it. Let me worry about it. I'll take care of it. I've got this. I'm present. I'm aware. I know you've got needs. And I'm not going to leave any of my children, any of my servants, with their needs unmet. Trust me. I've got this. Isn't that beautiful? Question number four. We're moving on. Matthew chapter 6, 28 to 30, we find question number four. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into 
the oven. Um, um, uh, th- this is reference to the fact that they had these little ovens and stuff that they would make and create and they would uh, 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 grab uh, bits of dead grass and stuff and they would throw it in and it would just be a part of the fire uh, process uh, that would then, you know, of course, heat up the water or the food or whatever it was that they were cooking. Um, this is what Jesus is talking about when he says oven, not an oven like today where we flick a switch or we turn on the gas. It, it was different. They used uh, this stuff that was laying on the ground and they would fire it up and it would bring heat to the oven so they could cook and, and so on. He says, uh, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. And here's the question, question number four. Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? In other words, let me, let me put this in other words. Notice how God takes care of the secondary things. Then how much more will he take care of that which is primary to him? If God takes care of this world we live in, he sends the rain and he sends the sunshine and he's got the tides happening and, and, and he knows when the lightning and the thunder and, 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 and he takes care of, of, of the, the, the plants and he takes care of the animals. He takes care of all that stuff. If he takes care of all of that, the secondary issues of life, then how much more will he take care of that which is primary upon his heart? That being you and that being me, that being the crowd of people that he's talking to that would have had many worries and many troubles and many anxieties and many things they were thinking about. Keep in mind, they didn't know that Jesus was going to start talking on the side of a mountain. They didn't say, let's go to a lecture about trusting God and not worrying. They didn't prep themselves mentally. They didn't do their research. They didn't come ready to hear this. They're just sitting there hearing whatever's coming out of Jesus' mouth for the first time. And so they're engaging with this and and wrestling with and meditating and thinking about and he's sitting there and he asks asks them this question. He says, is God not going to meet your needs? If he takes care of the secondary things, do you actually believe that he'll take care of your needs? And he doesn't just leave it there. He says, even if you have underdeveloped or absent faith. Think about that. Where, Where he says, oh, you of little faith, that word literally means underdeveloped faith. In other words, faith that is not fully grown yet. And we all have underdeveloped faith in different areas of our life. None of us have complete uh, uh, the finished product of faith in every area of our life, nor will we ever have that until we stand before Jesus uh, on the other side of eternity. Then, then maybe we'll be complete and have everything. This side of heaven, we will never have everything. We will never be complete. Our faith will never be complete. And I know sometimes we, 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 we try to portray that our faith is, you know, we trust God in everything. Let's, let's be humble enough to admit there are areas of our world where we trust God more and other areas of our world where we're learning to trust God. Maybe we don't know what God has to say about that area. Maybe we've never taken that first initial step of faith and had God come through that begins to build that trust and that faith in that area of life. All of us have underdeveloped faith. Jesus is not belittling the crowd and saying, will not I take more care of you, O you of little faith? He's not belittling them. He's just giving them a reality check and saying, it's okay that your faith is underdeveloped and it's okay that you're struggling with some of the things I'm talking about, but I want you to think about them because if you think about these things, it'll give you a great gauge of where your faith is really at and when you know where your faith is really at you know which areas you perhaps need to focus on and build study out learn about ask questions take little steps of faith to begin to trust God and see him come through in those areas of your will will he not much more question number four will he not much more clothe you are you of little faith see what he's doing here is he's bringing the focus back around to the character and the nature of God over and above our own capacity to perform perfectly in all situations. You can have little faith, you can have underdeveloped faith, and God can still come through for you. God will still do things for you. Sometimes I think we, we, we feel like, I've got to get my faith, there's this invisible level, and until I get my faith to that point, I can't really trust God. You know what, you can trust God with faith up here, you can trust God with faith down here. It doesn't matter where your faith is at, it still comes back to trust. It's just the question is, I can trust God more easily here because of my experiences, my encounters, uh, pre- what, what's previously happened or my understanding. It's, it's harder to trust God here but the act of trust happens at either end of the spectrum we can learn to trust God and and Jesus brings this all back he says even if you got little faith yeah the reason why you can trust God the reason why God 
provides your needs. Here's, here's the reality. The real reason why God provides for you and me, our basic needs, is because he decided to do it. He decided to do it. It's not because you've performed well. It's not because you've cracked the spiritual secret code. It's not because you, you got the prayer right. You know, you nailed that prayer. And so God went, I've been waiting for you to nail that prayer. Finally got it right. You've worked it out. You know, I remember many years ago, um, I'm talking to a, a friend of mine about uh, this, this young gentleman. I was invited um, uh, around to his house and uh, he, he was struggling with demonic oppression and I got the a phone call from this lady just out of the blue. Uh, someone recommended you to me. Can you come to my house in Brisbane? Uh, my son's here. He's got all things going on. I went there and uh, long story short, prayed for this young boy. He was set free from, from uh, uh, this demonic oppression. He just burst into laughter, started uh, speaking in tongues on the spot there on this lounge, was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment. I've never forgot it. And I'm sharing this story with this friend of mine and then it came up about um, uh, some other experiences that he'd seen and people that had, had, had uh, been involved in environments like that where they tried to deal with demonic oppression and cast out demons. And he made this statement to me. He said, yeah, this person failed. They didn't get it to happen. He said, because they didn't say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I sat there and I just kind of looked at him thinking it was a bit of a gag and, and he, he was serious. He said, because they only said, come out in Jesus' name, he said, they didn't say in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because they left off the Christ of Nazareth bit, Jesus wasn't going to set that kid free and that demon wasn't going to leave because you have to add the Christ of Nazareth bit. And I thought, that's a bit loopy. You see, the minute we put too much of an emphasis on our capacity, our ability, what we do, how we have to get it right, when we lean too far towards our own performance and too far away from the character and the nature of God as revealed through his word, we tend to move into legalism and religion. And we just want to be careful. We just want to be careful in those situations. In fact, I wrote an email this week to uh, a, a friend of mine. I, I sent and uh, I had some correspondence with him around another issue. And uh, he picked up on just a little phrase that was in an email that was somewhat innocuous and, and was taken out of context. But anyway, he wrote to me and, and expressed that um, you know, he wasn't too keen on that. So uh, I wrote this back to him. This was my response. I said, whenever we have a conviction, preach a doctrine, adhere to a teaching, etc., but remove the grace of God, from the equation, we always end up with a form of legalism. Whether it be prayer, Bible reading, fasting, tithing, loving others, even the power of our words. When it becomes more about who we are than who he is. Or more about what we do than what he did. Or what we are trying to achieve than what he's already achieved for us on the cross. Then we need to be very careful. And I love how Jesus rounds this bit out. He brings it all back to even though you got little faith. Even though your faith is underdeveloped, I want you to know that I am still going to meet your needs. I'm still going to care for you. Why? Because God is good. God is gracious. God is loving. All he wants is that we would choose him as our master. All he wants is that we would make the choice to follow after him. Faith will grow. Faith will come. But don't ever sit there and think, I can't approach God because I don't have faith at a certain point. Don't ever make uh, uh, your relationship with God more about your own personal faith level than it is about the goodness and the greatness and the grace and the mercy and the compassion of your heavenly Father. And that's big picture thinking. That's what Jesus is saying here. My part is to choose who will I serve. Who's going to be my master? And if I choose Jesus and I walk with Jesus to the best of my capacity and I make my decisions based on what I understand of eternity and the kingdom, then he's saying here, you do that. You worry about building the kingdom of God. You worry about seeking the kingdom of God. And I'll worry about taking care of your needs. I'll worry about your personal kingdom here on earth. Trust me. Trust me. What a beautiful picture. I'm going to get Daniel to come on up now. He's going to lead us in some worship. In conclusion, let me just throw a couple of things at you. See, I can imagine when Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount, you know, the crowd doing whatever it is that, that the crowd did. I can imagine at the end of the entire thing that some would have thought, uh, you know, what a, what a crazy guy. He obviously doesn't live in my world. What he's talking about, he obviously doesn't live in my world. And they would have just probably got up, walked away, and, and, and probably just, just dismissed everything that Jesus had to say in that sermon. How many of us have done that on a Sunday? We come along, we hear a message, uh, and, and we get up and we go and we just dismiss it. Maybe we chew out the pastor, maybe we chew out the message, whatever it is, the preacher, but we just dismiss it. Whole-handedly gone. 
There would have been people there that would have got up and dismissed what Jesus had to say. Others would have moved on and started thinking about their evening's happenings, forgetting quickly all that the rabbi on the hill was trying to teach them. And we've probably done that too. We've probably walked out and gone, what a fantastic sermon. I really enjoyed that. That was great. But what I'm walking into, what I'm about to do, becomes more dominant, more important. And so I quickly move away from all that great teaching I heard and I start thinking about everything else and prioritizing other stuff in that moment. I mean, maybe it goes back to the parable of the soil. You know, the farmer sows the seeds and and the weeds and the worries and the cares of life and different things choke it out. Only a small percentage actually allow that seed to germinate and produce a crop. So some would have dismissed him straight away. But there would have been some that continued to think about the questions that Jesus presented to them that day. There would have been some who walked away and they would have wrestled with those questions, those rhetorical questions Jesus asked. There would have been some who walked away and would have talked to other people about them, maybe began conversations amongst their peer group, their friends at church, and, 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 and discussed it. There would have been also some that maybe went back to them Old Testament writings and pulled them out and just kind of you know, blew the dust off that book that maybe has been sitting on the shelf for so long and decided to go through those ancient documents and ask the question, is there any validity to what Jesus said? Can I find answers to those rhetorical questions amongst these ancient writings? There would have been those that went and did that as well. And I think that's what we need to be doing as we bring these last six weeks to a close. So I want to give you four questions. Four questions. And I want you to think about them. Number one, does your life reflect the fact that there's more to it than earthly, temporal things? Does your life reflect the fact that there's more to life than just the temporal and the earthly realm which we live in? Now, if it doesn't, then you'll probably never truly trust God for life this side of eternity. Because if there's no room this side of eternity for God, it speaks for itself. How can you trust a God that you've got no time for this side of eternity? I'll worry about it when I get there. But does your life reflect the fact that there's more to it than earthly temporal things, the things that you do, the words you say, what you do with your money, what you do with your time? Does it reflect the fact that to you there's more to life than just here and now? I wonder if you quizzed your workmates. I wonder if you quizzed your friends, your family. I wonder if they'd say, you know what? I can tell that your life is more than just what you can see, taste, touch, feel and smell. There's something about your life that's beyond the materialistic world we live in. I wonder what sort of response we would get if we ran that past those who were closest to us. Question number two. Do you believe that God values you highly and above all other created things despite your current performance? Straight away, some of us look at ourselves and go, no, well, God couldn't because I did or because I thought. God doesn't love you based on your performance. God loves you based on the fact that he made you. God loves you because you're created in his image, devoid of your performance. God loves you. Brennan Manning, one of my favorite authors, he wrote this. He said, God loves us as we are and not as we should be, for none of us are as we should be. And God loves you as you are today, faults and all. And God values you, not because of your performance, but because of who you are. As a parent loves their children with the same passionate love, whether they are obeying them in the moment or disobeying them in the moment. Don't ever say that that parent's love changed based on the child's performance. Discipline may come into place. The, 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 the consequence may come differently from a different space, but it's coming from the same heart of passionate love and value for that child. Do you believe that God values you highly and above all other created things despite your current performance? Question number three. Whose worry or concern have the greatest capacity to bring about the best outcome for your life? Your own worry and concern? or God's? Let me ask that one again. Whose worry or concern has the greatest capacity to bring about the best outcome for your life? Your own or God's? See, God can tell us not to worry about our life. He can tell us that for one reason only, because He knows that He is. He's concerned. And He's looking out for us, and we can trust Him. And question number four. Do you believe God can meet you where you are at today? Great faith, little faith, or no faith? Do you believe in a God that values you, that knows you, that is concerned enough for you that he can come and meet you right now? I want to say this to you. I don't know where your faith is at, but I want to say this. One thing I know about God, he meets us on mountaintops and he meets us in valleys. He meets us in the brightest of sunshine. He meets us in the darkest of corners. 
All he waits for is for an invitation that we'd open up our heart and we would say, God, would you come? Father, take my life at 19 years of age. I come humbly before God. I said, Lord, I haven't done things great up to this point. I can't do this life on my own. God, I need you. I accepted that 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, God came to earth in the form of a man, Jesus Christ, that he was uh, crucified, buried, and resurrected three days later. He was crucified not for anything he did wrong, but for everything that I did wrong. And if I would put my faith in him and live for him this side of eternity, if I would make that choice to serve him, to make him my master, that when I stand before God, God will look at me and say, son, your sins, your wrongdoings, your faults, your shocker, it's been paid for in full by my son Jesus 2,000 years ago on the cross. Enter into your rest. I've passed on from judgment because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago and because I put my faith in him. And I don't know where you're at in your faith right now, but can I encourage you to consider the claims of Jesus? And maybe you're sitting there right now and you want to give your life to Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's no formula. Just express to God from your heart your gratitude for Jesus' death on the cross. Express to God your sorrow over your own life, your own sins, the things that you've done, things I've done that that were the reasons why Jesus had to come and die on the cross in the first place. And then make the conscious choice that you're going to turn your life around and you're going to get into these ancient documents and you're going to begin to live your life fully and wholeheartedly with devotion to God. Now, if you do that, I'll make a promise to you. He said he would send his Holy Spirit to come and to fill you and to be inside of you. And God will change you from the inside out. You don't have to become religious and do things to please God. God will enter your world. He will change your heart and you'll want to do the things that please God. Let me pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you, God, for this journey we've been on. Lord, I want to thank you that you want us to live a life that is, uh, God, emblazoned with the peace of God. You want us to live a life that has uh, diminished worry and anxiety because you know worry and anxiety don't change anything. They simply hurt your creation. They hurt the very people that you love. And so, God, I pray for each person, Lord. God, as we get up from here, that we wouldn't just run off, forget it, move on. God, I pray we would dwell, we would think, we would wrestle with your words. I pray, God, that that for some people watching today, let today be a moment where they just make that decision. I'm going to get into the Word of God. I'm going to find out what the Word of God has to say. And I'm just going to make the decision to trust God, even when I don't understand it, even when it makes no sense to me. I'm going to trust God and begin that journey of building and deepening my faith, trusting God not just for eternity, but trusting God for everything I'm about to confront from this moment on in my life. Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
rushing or a fountain flowing. I've seen your grace that never stops pursuing. It's a love so grandeur, exceeding goodness, taking captive every lofty hindrance. It never runs out on me. stops chasing me, Jesus, I know you never will, oh, for I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living.
Goodness of the Lord in the land. 